excited to have everybody in here. Um, and this is the uh, the artisan track. We've been jamming on everything engineering oriented. Uh, it's been a really nice flavor of everything below the anchor contract, and then you know the developer relations lens of what you do with all this this knowledge and content. So it's kind of cool to have some DevRel folks in here. Um, that you know I look at at uh, at people and you know two of y'all did this course, and and we know everybody here, which is um, super exciting. Um, Berg, uh, we we submitted this project uh, to be built. Uh, you know, a minute ago, and Berg actually went through our uh, builders course and then became an artisan with us, and and uh, now is doing some dev shop work with us. Uh, this is a very Rust centric project, but this is validate, so we're excited about it. And I'm going to mute myself, turn the floor over to Berg to uh, show off some skills. All right, thanks, Jeff. Let me start with sharing my screen. One more time. Zoom in. Stuff away. All right. Welcome. Today is a holiday day. Um, you might have heard about the this tool before. We didn't really announce it yet, but it uh, it uh, opened up for everybody. Um, it's still in development, but it kind of it, it kind of does already the nice part of the of what it should do. Yeah, like uh, like Jeff said, I, I started uh, last year at VBA um, with the course. Uh, I learned a lot, but I also had some some knowledge from from times before before I joined uh, VBA. So it was not not completely new for me. Um, but it's a, it was a really interesting project to work on, or it's a really interesting project to work on, nonetheless. It's already open on GitHub. You can find it. Uh, I think I'm gonna paste the address here. So what is Validate? Validate is your uh, local composable the uh, Wally data setup. What it actually does from a high level view is um, it allows you to uh, clone accounts from any kind of Solana network, from, ma from mainnet, from devnet, or any kind of uh, other kind of networks that are uh, coming up more on the chain. It allows you to clone accounts, clone programs, uh, adjust them, add it to your own custom ledger, and fire up test validator to, to test your program or whatever you're building. So the program that tackles is uh, from one side is, I could say, the network. So one of the main points of validate to help the network um, in the sense of developers don't have to, um, when you want to work in an env environment, uh, for example, a marketplace environment, you want to have your, um, all the, all the programs that are attached to that um, to that uh, marketplace, all the PDAs and everything like that, it, to develop your program. Or now, or, or you have the solution to call, clone the accounts one by one, and then fire up the test validator. Uh, but that's a little bit of cumbersome, and it can be easier. So validate tackles a part of giving you an easy way to call alone uh, an environment from mainnet or from devnet create your own custom ledger, add those accounts to your custom ledger and fire up locally. So not not uh, uh, putting that pressure on the, on the DevNet or even on mainnet, if you have some environment that is only available on mainnet, you don't have to actually use mainnet for testing, but you can clone everything from mainnet, set up your own uh, environment and with just a few commands, you can test your program locally. Um, I think I'm going to start with a little bit of uh, kind of live demo to show what it does. I hope everybody can see. Yeah, uh, the program is uh, uh, built on top of 
a little bit of top of the test validator code. So there are levels in the test validator um, uh, structures that structures that you can use to create your own custom ledger. We picked the uh, we picked the level that we thought it's it's sufficient enough to to make the compile time not that too long, um, but still be able to to customize the ledger at your account and just fire up test validator with the created uh, um, custom ledger. So I already compiled it a few minutes ago. I'm gonna copy. I'm gonna fire. So first, when you fire a polydate, you you get an interactive menu. For now, there is a this what you see here is a test configuration, what I was using to to develop the program itself. When you enter the, uh, the interactive menu, you have a few options to choose from. You can clone program, clone account, edit program, edit an account, compose configs. Uh, the first four is, is kind of speaks for themselves. Compose configs means um, in case of validate, you have a configuration file which contains everything that you are that you are working with. So basically, it contains the project name, uh, all the networks that you are using in your uh, in your um, commands, all the programs that you already possibly cloned, all the accounts that you possibly cloned from other networks. There is a part for override that's going to come later. I'm going to come back for this a little later. And of course, the IDLs. Because if there is a program and there's an IDL available, we of course want to have the IDL to, to use it later on in the, in the flow of the program. Uh, the last one is generate custom ledger. That's the command that you run when you already decided how you want to, how you want to configure your environment with what accounts and what kind of changes you want to do. So I think I'm going to go with the uh, cloning account. I'm going to go with mainnet. And I'm going to go wild. I'm going to pick one of the last transactions. That looks good. I'm just going to pick one of the accounts. I assume this is going to be EDH, but let's see. So I have the account. That's it. Account is cloned. There is a working directive for validate. There, everything gets saved, all the accounts uh, in a binary format. All the programs in, a, in, a, in an ASO format, so only the byte code of the program. And of course, the IDL, if there's a, as an, an available IDL that we want to use later. So that can't what you clone now. Sweetie M. That's uh, the first one. All right, now that I clone an account, I can also edit it. Um, for normal accounts, of course, in the multiple layers of the accounts, the, the top Solana layer when it's actually just an account, and then under that it can be a token account or it can be a PDA or whatever structure it can have. Um, if it's a normal account, um, you're gonna have the fields um, deserialized from the from the bytecode of the account. So you see the owner, the land ports. If it's a PDA or if it's a token account, you can you can choose to unpack them. That's a, that's also a possibility. So of course you can clone token accounts, and those have different fields like authority that you want to have to uh, edit the authority. You can do that in here, or if it's a PDA, it's going to be deserialized based on the ideal on the fly without having the structure of the PDA. Um, get thrown into a vector and, and present it for you to to edit whatever fields you want to edit. So, for example, if you want to choose to edit the amount of lamp ports that the account has, 
you can do exactly that. You can add a few more uh, numpers to the account. When you do the edit account again, you can see that the amount of LAN ports is, is edited. So it's already in the working directory with uh, edit on it. And it's not only that, but if you edit an account, that you also create an override. An override, that means it's going to be present in the validate JSON. So anybody that fires up the validate uh, CLI with this, with this configuration file is going to already have this override, what you, what you did on your account, pre-configured. So the account already going to be adjusted uh, how you want to present this environment for everybody. It's really handy. Uh, it's the really handy part of uh, when you want to share your own configuration file, when you want to share your configuration file for 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 a marketplace with all the accounts already pre-edited uh, or edited for a specific use case. You can just create this JSON file and give it to somebody else. They can run validate with the JSON file next to it, and they're going to have the, the environment set up completely. Also, the nice thing is, like this working directory here, even if I Even if I choose to delete it, but then I run validate again, it's going to see that you don't have the accounts cloned in your environment. So it's going to prompt you to clone the, or if you want to clone the accounts or not. Also, if you want to say yes, it's going to create the, create the working environment, clone all the accounts, all the ideas, all the programs again. And it's going to prompt you to, to do whatever you want. So that's really nice of a feature. You don't really have to care about if the accounts are there. You just have to have the configuration file to set up a whole environment with just a comment and do whatever you want. From here on, I can, I can actually say generate the custom ledger. And it generates a custom ledger. This part is, is uh, the part what we, what we got from the test validator in the sense of code. And because now we have the test ledger here, I can I can fire up uh, the test validator. It's gonna pick up that this uh, ledger directory and it's gonna with the account said that I'm gonna fire up your validator. Let's see if it's really worked. So that double nine on the end says that we success, successfully cloned the account, edited the LAN ports, and fired up the test validator just with a few comments, which is really nice if you ask me. I was I was really looking for something like this uh, a year or two ago when I was working on programs and I needed an environment. So it's really it's really nice that that was that was able to to build something like this and help everybody else uh, of achieving this. Uh, is easy management of environments. There's some other really cool stuff too, right, guys? So like when you're building a smart contract locally, usually you like don't have access to the USDC mint, for example. Because like USDC is the most common trading pair. If you use validate, you can either give yourself a million dollars by just modifying a token account that you own, or you can even like make yourself the mint authority for USDC, so you can just like airdrop yourself as much as you want. There's a lot of really cool stuff like that where you don't need to break your API to test locally versus on mains. So this might be a, a big ask, but can we demo that live? I would love to see what the steps are involved because it sounds, from what was just demoed, it sounds like it's just grab the account detail, go into the edit, update to yourself, and that's it. Because that's actually it. That was okay. actually the live demo. <laughs> that would be awesome yeah. to see. Because like it's, that's one of the big things that like if you could just have, for example, if you could I could see a plugin with validate 
to where it literally just gives you 100 million USDC, and that's it. <laughs> like that's the, <laughs> that's the whole thing. Um, it's absolutely people, possible. Okay. It's absolutely possible. It's it's actually all the functions are there to do exactly what you just said. You can just add an override with your own account, and when you fire up Validate, it's gonna apply the override automatically, and you're gonna have a million USDC or whatever you have. Got it. Uh, question for the for the configuration, and sorry if I'm interrupting you. <laughs> no, sure, um, sure. Go ahead, please. Good, for, for the configuration, do you have any like uh, key or I guess variables that you can put into it to where it will set? Like for example, we have the the we could set the owner to something, and I want to set it to whatever my current uh, public key is locally, um, whatever the config has. Is there any like special variables that I can do? there to where i don't have to specify the exact owner but i can specify hey whatever is at my solana config uh id json or whatever uh, so that basically in that usdc example that i just gave where it's a plugin that automatically when you load up with the validated config will give you 100 million usdc i can just have the plugin say use whoever's the current uh config public key do, do you have that today no not today okay but this function apply overrides can easily have a, a an optional field which can be pulled in from the json and just do what what you just said okay to yeah because apply, I would... apply yeah for sure it's as you can see i don't know if you uh i mean yeah, it's it's a little bit of a rust, but actually I'm I'm iterating through all the programs and all the accounts. And if I add an extra variable here, which is can be an optional whatever, like I said, pulled out from the JSON, it can just add that one million USDC to all the token accounts that uh, that uh, that it runs through. Cool. So uh, luckily, the, the the structure of the whole thing to to actually edit the accounts and and pull the stuff and pull the JSON, the ideal, and serialize them. That was, that's already here. So adding these kind of functions is just adding a few uh, variable and uh, a line of code here. That's awesome. I love the way that's built. That was the, that was the purpose to, to make it, make it uh, open, understandable, but also everybody can go further with uh, developing whatever he wants to develop. Awesome. Yeah, so let's go back a little bit to the holiday JSON. Um, on the end, there is also this compose. Uh, for example, this is what we are pulling in from from the JSON. So the next uh, that switch, what you what Jacobs was talking about, probably going to be a next field here under this, and just edit uh, true or false, and the change is going to be applied on your account. What it compose does is you can add this field and you can add a file name to it. For now, it's a relative path. And this JSON should be another validate config. Like I talk about, everybody can share their own environment just with a validate config. They can easily give you a JSON file from their config and you can say, yeah, um, I like this environment or I want to use that environment together with my own. So I'm going to compose the two together. Uh, your environments or your JSON file are going to be the leader. So if there are accounts in your JSON file that, uh, that has changes or it's present in both JSON files. So for example, in the other validate or yeah, in the, in the other validate JSON, what you got, then your account going to be the, the leader. So your account going to be get, going to get into the custom ledger. So just bumping to think. A better yeah, way, go like I, I just say, like my my way of describing this is like it's composable, but it's hierarchical, right? And so it's composable in the sense that you can inject uh, validate files into validate files in the same way as you can with like a package JSON file in uh, npm. But the higher up the file is, uh, will determine who wins in the case of an account conflict. So just think about. Whatever is like the like the including file will always be below the file that's including it in terms of hierarchy.
I also think like, just to point out, I think that that's actually a really good thing because you'll notice whenever you've ever tried to do anything with dependencies in Solana, that it works precisely the other way. The package tells you what you're including and you have to figure out a way to work around what it's doing, right? This is quite the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jean. That was uh, really cool. Yeah, so I don't yeah, know what you... I was going to say some, one other thing too, right? Um, as for like configuring variables, um, like in the same way that it's possible to like, you know, modify a, a JSON file, like it would be possible to inject variables into a, a validate JSON file if you were using like Docker or something like that. Um, without us necessarily having to do anything to support it. But yeah, it is a it is a good consideration to think about like how do we handle that? Yeah. Uh, let me see. I want to show the leisure part. And actually So one one more thing, uh, what I would add is, uh, yeah, thanks Dean for for the explanation. Uh, is that you can go uh, twenty files deep, and that's a little bit of a, a safety measure and what we talk about uh, with Dean. So it's not that that uh, anybody with the malicious uh, worry they JSON and can exhaust your, uh, all their resources on your system and then just scratch it. So just consider that that you can add uh, a 20 uh, recursive validate JSON files together, compose them together. After that, uh, I'm just going to stop. Yeah, I think uh, BPF gives us 50. So, you know, <laughs> we are not quite as right. generous as yeah, BPF. Yeah. yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think 20 is yeah. really quite OK. You can always compose uh, our validate files together, just uh, apart, and then you just throw it into to the line uh, when you want to compose them together again. So the limit is just for one one iteration that you can go twenty files deep. But of course, you could also um, you could also just compile your own version without the limit if you really really needed to, because it's going to be open source. Exactly. So. Exactly. Like I said, it's open for everybody to to adjust to to customize for yourself. It's made for developers. With love. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of love. So I of know course. today it's the uh, relative path. Is there a possibility of like doing a link to like a GitHub uh, link in the future? Yeah, exactly. That's what Dean was talking about as well. <laughs> okay. It's already part. It's already part of the plan. So uh, pulling in from from a, a GitHub repo. Uh, we also plan to just create a GitHub repo and present some example validate config file for everybody to just look at and just you know pull it and customize it for yourself. Okay, and then just to make sure I understand, Dean, your point earlier with the uh, the configurations that you put in here, the ones that are you said they're hierarchical. So the ones that are done. So if you're composing, say you're composing on uh, test JSON. And it has account A in it, but in your in your validate JSON, you have account A as well. Um, are you saying that the account A in your validate JSON will override the? Yes. Instance? Okay, just making sure yeah. I understand. That. So if you think of it as a hierarchy, right? Whatever you include has less precedence over what you're including it in. So if we both, uh, let's say, like I, I can give you a really good example. Let's say that, like, you know, because for the longest time, like, Metaplex has been like hard to work with, right? Like, someone made themselves um, the upgrade authority of Metaplex and all their tests, and then they like suddenly migrated to this, and it's like, oh, my uh, authority is not working, right? Like, they could override the authority in their own file, and it would not be overwritten by the existing Metaplex authority when they just cloned it from the other file. Like, awesome. what, yeah, whatever's in the, the local. Configuration will always beat anything that is included in it, and you know that's kind of how it works all the way down. Awesome. And then I think this I had I don't know if I may have missed if it was answered, but Jack's question: Are the compose can the compose be a list as well? 
uh, what do you mean by a list? A list of JSONs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like NPM. It's like that. That's really cool. <laughs> um, the other thing I was going to say too, right, is like when we originally started out with this, we were launching the test validator directly, and then we came up against some pretty crazy stuff. So like, we weren't sure if we would hit the CLI limit just for like raw inputs to a function. Because if, for example, like if you run this in Docker, Docker will have like some limitations around how much like some some Docker instances have a maximum uh, argument size, and you know there's just all sorts of weird stuff like that that can happen if you're just relying upon the CLI. Uh, and if you think about doing something like cloning a Jupyter swap and running that on local net, which is like honestly our biggest gauntlet, it's like either that or running. Uh, like a full geyser plugin or something like with uh compressed nfts like they're the two like you know if you've done this you can you know you have a like something better than mainnet on your computer right um but the 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 thing is like when we were doing that we kind of like came up against the realization that if we modify the if we want to like have like bigger inputs we're gonna have to modify the test validator and make it more sort of performant and then we kind of realized, like, if you modify the test validator, we have this like ongoing dependency. So if the test validator updates, we probably have to go and update some stuff, right? And then there's also other tooling out there. Um, the name escapes me, but the guy from Iron Forge, I think it's Thor, is it? Uh, what's his tool called, Jacob? Thorsten is Project Lucid. Lucid, right? So like, there are other um, like non lab slash Anza test validator projects like that out there, right? And they, uh, if, so if we, if we, instead of having the dependency of the test validator, we generate the ledger, we realize that we can leverage all of those other tools. And so if anyone else makes like an alternative test validator, right? They're gonna speak the same ledger language, right? They have to, because that's like the protocol. Um, but yeah, so it just means that if someone makes a better test validator, which, you know, like Lucid is a pretty good uh, tool if you haven't used it. It just means that we can just integrate with that immediately. And I think that that was like a very pivotal moment in this project. Um, I remember putting the challenge out to Berg and he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll have a look. And then within like, I don't know, half an hour or something, he's like, okay, yeah, yeah I got something. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was a really like, in my opinion, like just, as a build, like part of the build process, I think that was like a really interesting point. Yeah, and then uh, I actually have to hop and I'll let the rest of my team uh, listen in for the rest of things. But one last question I had is that you mentioned Jupyter and uh, the DAS basically, right? Um, or I guess it's compression, which kind of turns into DAS at some point. Um, can you do that today? Have you tried it? Theoretically, yes. We haven't like accomplished it, but theoretically, yes. Okay, uh, it's just cool. you know, um, the biggest problem with something like say Jupiter, right? Is like I don't think you'd be able to do it on like say the sole USDC pair or something. But if you pick the token that like doesn't move around that much, you'd probably be able to capture the entire um, account lookup table before things move so far out of range that your uh, your slippage for your instruction wouldn't work. But um, for Jupyter, like typically what you would want to do is clone down all the account states. So you have like some kind of like um, reference. Um, I think there actually may be a way to do this. Uh, if you look at like the simulate API for a transaction on the Solana Explorer, I believe it can show like previous and post states as well. So I think there may be something there that we could leverage. I have to look into it a bit more. But the main thing is not can we do it, it's just can we capture a good snapshot of the network state at some point in time so that our transaction would be repeatable locally. Um, but in terms of just like setting up all the accounts with data and stuff, absolutely, that's like, that's done. Got it. Um, I got to yeah. hop. I'll let Jonas, John, and Brianna uh, continue, but awesome. <laughs> You're good. Thanks, Jacob. That was awesome. Thanks, Dean. Um, 
I think I'm. I think I'm gonna do a test uh, doing. Uh, PDA. So another nice thing with Validate is that if you are cloning an account and it sees that it's a PDA, so that it's owned by the program, for example, Radium, it's going to clone also the program with it. So you're going to get two accounts. And that's also part of uh, how you're going to build up the whole thing. So this four, this was the account I cloned. And the six or seven five k was uh, the radium. I like it. C. Did we get a JSON? No, we didn't. So, well, that's uh, not going to be a good example then. I think I'm going to go with uh, one of these. Is it a market? Or well, yeah, I don't wanna I don't wanna search it out right now. Um what else what else could be interesting uh, around validate? Should we go into a little bit of uh, a code a little deeper, some rest to see how the structure Definitely. is built up? All right. So I guess I guess if you if you build some rust before you you met with club, that's that's the uh, the library that everyone uses to build some really nice user interfaces, command line user interfaces, of course. Uh, we choose to use for options that you can choose. They're one going to bring you into the inter interactive interactive menu. Uh, it's like the rest uh, explained above the command. Um, it follows a little bit of the routing, routing way of uh, of handling things. That's also how Anchor uh, handles handles the stuff on chain. So that can be familiar a little bit if you if you looked in a little bit of the expanded Anchor code, but where all your macros are getting expanded, and you see everything that's uh, your twenty lines of twenty lines of code becomes that six thousand lines of uh, Rust code, and then that gets compiled. So, yeah, simple programs are, are simple commands. For the ledger creation, there is an extra variable to, if you have an already existing uh, test ledger folder already created before, you can you can say that just yeah, just overwrite it immediately. Otherwise, you're gonna get prompted to, do you really want to overwrite your created test ledger? So you get the chance to to copy it out if you want to. Let's see. Can I can do the run command? Well, it's still it's still it's still mostly the the routing part. Let's uh, take a look at the clone. So that's clone account function. You are already passing the validate context together with the uh, with the command itself. So if there is a config that was on the disk and the validate picked it up at the start, you're gonna send the config. Um, with the command together, so you can adjust it. Of course, it's immutable, so you can adjust it on the fly here inside of the function. And you get prompted to to add in the account what you what I just showed you, and then we're gonna go to the add account function, add account unchecked. It's going to check if it's already in your context so you don't clean the same car or don't clone the same account two times when it made sure that it's not in your context it's gonna it's gonna clone it just pull it uh, down from the network and the public key really simple fetch account command adds it to your uh, uh, context accounts and the network uh, as it's a hash set just just gonna try to push the new network into the into the the vector or the hash set if it uh, so if you added an account it's going to check if it has a program of course we are filtering out some of the 
some of the programs and we are planning to filter out a little more um oh no sorry that's the clone program part how was i some things that you guys might not even necessarily think about right it's like you clone a pda that pda belongs to a program so then like automatically it's like if we got a pda then we got to get the program for the pda we got to download the executable account for that we got to download the idl right and then like whatever uh, if it happened to be like a, a token account or something right like we'd have to sort of uh basically there's this whole cascading sort of like uh dependency tree behind each account that validate just kind of takes all the guesswork out of and so um try to pay attention to sort of all the crazy things that that berg's done here because there's a lot going on <laughs> it's nice it's really it was really it was really nice to to write this code because it really has a purpose behind so everything what dean says is true and the cascading is is, is made to make your life easier so you can you can easier do the things what you really have to do and don't think about how to do those things. So what I said uh, just a minute ago, if there is a if there is a uh, a program that owns that account that you just cloned, it's gonna check for that. So we're gonna add more of the programs here. Um, what you don't want to clone because it's already part of the the custom ledger. Because of course there are programs that are uh, added to the ledger when you fire it up. That's behind the scenes. So that's that's actually how you clone an account and everything gets checked. Uh, the owner gets checked. And if it's a if it's a program, then clone the program, clone the program data, clone the IDL, and add everything to your context. Of course, everything uh, gets uh, atomically saved. So every time or any time that you crash or it happens, something happens. You're gonna have your wallet day JSON, and even if you lose your accounts or are getting compromised or um, corrupted for whatever reason, uh, you can just delete it and run wallet date, and you have the account freshly again. So that's that's really a, a nice part of it. I think that's that was one of the first functions where I was really glad to have. So I was of course messing with account data. I was editing account data, and then I would think about yeah, it's it's really massive to just you know type it in one by one. So I made a function to clone all the accounts in once <laughs> when you fire up the validate or when you fire up validate. So I just made myself my life just a little bit tiny bit easier. And that's how you also that's how it's also gonna help uh, hopefully gonna help everybody else. Um okay. So I think it's it's for for the program part. It's almost the same, I could say. Uh, let me see. So it's gonna prompt you for the program and then it's gonna, of course, check if it, the program is already in, in, in your, in your, in your uh, context. If it's not, then this part gonna come. Uh, let's see edit well that's uh that was also a fun part of it so uh, token accounts i was i was really lucky because uh let's see edit if it's a token account i already have a structure uh, i can pull from the solander but one just deserialize the account itself but if there is nothing and i want to uh, edit the file and i want to edit a pda I want to have to. I'm gonna to have to work with the with the IDL. So then you have to pull the the JSON IDL, and you know if you, if you search about deserializing Borsch without having the structure, even if you have the ideal of the the structure itself, you're gonna find uh, everybody gonna say no, don't do it. It's it's bad, but we do it anyways <laughs> because it's fun. And it works. It's uh, it's uh, 
of course, it uh, it was it was necessary to look, to read a little bit of the Porsche uh, uh, specification, how actually the types are getting stored and uh, some of them getting stored just by itself, like integers. Um, but some of the longer things, like um, if it's a vector, it's going to have a length and the byte data, or if it's a string, that's also variable length array behind the scene. So that's also going to have a length and also going to have the byte itself. So based on the JSON IDL, you can, and, and with the data of the count, you can just iterate through bytes and just uh, just look for the, the size. Or if it's a, yeah, if it's a, if it's a U8 or it's, a, it's, it's, it's an integer, you can look for that size in the byte array and just pick out that and then move further. And that's how you deserialize the account on the fly without actually creating the structure or having the structure of it. These, 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 um, <laughs> these functions are really, really eye opening because, um, well, you're not going to see a lot of deserializing and working with slices on, on the local day on the local stuff or in CLIs. Sometimes yes, sometimes not. But when we're getting on the chain, you're going to see much more of this try from slice or clone from slice or, or all those kind of operations that are that are not actually using a, an extra piece of memory, but just uh, using the already created something and just filling stuff in there. Of course, some stuff still has to be worked out, but the main things, for example, I noticed that anchor programs most of the times have arrays of something. So that was the, one of the first things I, I build up to, to be able to deserialize any kind of array that are in the PDA or in the PDA field and then be able to serialize it back again. So you can add it back to the account and add, uh, add it to your custom ledger. So besides having some of the parts like you uh, at 256 bit the outside integer, which is not really used on, on the chain for now, not worked out, basically all the functions are ready to, to handle all the stuff that has to be handled. And uh, a little bit simplified way of, of representing the, the type, what you find uh, based on the ideal. Um, I made it an enum field so you can pass around the stuff within, within it and that uh, might get some more fields here if I if I work further and uh, I find that uh, for example a generic or generic LAN array has some different kind of representation I'm gonna have to add that as well but again besides that you can already do basically everything you can clone accounts you can adjust them you can deserialize a, a, a PDAs, you can adjust them, add your custom ledger and just fire it up. That's, uh, of course, discriminator. If you worked with Anchor, you already heard about discriminators. Uh, when you are giving an, we are giving an ideal account or a PDA account that you want to edit, it's going to match the first eight bytes on uh, on the discriminator map, which is generated from the JSON, what you what you pulled from the chain, so you already have a, a a list of what kind of accounts you can deserialize based on based on an IDL. That's uh, that's actually what happens here. Well, I don't know if uh, if I'm gonna go any further with these kind of stuff because. We would get into the smaller pieces. I mean, we could look at um we like getting into the weeds, Berg. So do you. I mean <laughs> I think I'm, I'm I think I'm gonna look at uh, the ledger creation. That's 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 kind of uh, that was also the interesting part. Like Dean said, we we faced kind of a lot of not a lot, but we faced like really weird uh, problems while we were building uh, validate uh, and we were also considering the things that could happen so for example what dean said there is a limit of how many accounts you can add 
to the CLI, to the Solana CLI or the test validator CLI itself to co clone from, from, from another chain. So uh, to get around those limitations, we choose to, to go one step deeper. So that's what you see here is, is basically what, uh, what the test validator does in, in like on a high level view, because of course, uh, the block store and the create Genesis config leader X function, which, which, uh, which is specific, I would say specifically made for the test validator is, is something that's, that's under the hood in the test validator, but really not the top layer, but the layer down. So you could, you could say, I want to do a new test validator and then it's going to pull the, or yeah, it's going to run through the whole soul and the validator startup thing like like generating everything and, and 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 i don't even know what kind of stuff is happening when you fire up a, a validator but a lot of stuff is happening so we were able to instead of creating a full test validator we were able to just get the pieces out from from the test validator code that allows us to create a ledger and be able to add accounts to the ledger so what you see here is 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 basically just validator stuff you need some things that uh, that you need in the ledger folder to make the the validator work um maybe that's inter one interesting i would say is the faucet because uh, first uh, i was not adding the faucet and, and then dean run the program once and then he said yeah i can't get any airdrops uh, i said oh yeah that's strange <laughs> And then I realized that I I just forget to add uh, the faucet, uh, which is again like I said at the beginning, it's made like you can add whatever uh, whatever else you want. So you can you know create another account here in the line if you want to just go ahead and compile yourself, and then just you know it's gonna add it. Uh, it's gonna get uh, added to the. I mean, yeah you can get it in here and then it gets added to your uh, custom ledger. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you, you were talking about the discriminator, right? And uh, first, uh, we are slicing first eight bytes, if I remember properly. I, I might be wrong, but uh, isn't that just uh, like unique to anchor programs? And uh, if you are looking into like other native programs, their own implementation will have different uh, uh, discriminator size, right? Yeah, of course, of course. But yeah. for for other programs, you also don't have an IDL, so you can't really generate the discriminator map. So that okay. discriminator map is really focusing on anchor accounts and okay. generating the discriminator for anchor mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Got it. That's, that function is very unique for just anchor programs. Okay. We could say, yeah, we could say. Of course, Do you can uh, you can expand it like you know for anchor you have eight bytes. For native programs, you have just one. That's yeah. But the thing is, like, we can um, we can code in some exceptions, right? Like, tokens would make sense. Vote accounts maybe would make sense. Maybe the staking program would make sense. But you know, our our goal is to get this tool out in the wild, and then you know, anyone who wants to add those things can. I mean, the nice thing about the IDL is like we can just uh, you know cover most programs you know uh, and certainly um we can cover like you know metaplex which is i think the biggest like thing that people really import yeah yeah, yeah. fair enough makes sense i would say uh, the, the next thing which is also on the plan of doing like we talked about it is uh creating a function to just simply give an, a, a transaction hash and just clone the whole thing every account every pda every everything that's uh it's related to the transaction. So that's a uh, fits to that, I guess. Yeah, um, from here on, you just gonna check in your context and add the programs one by one, add the accounts one by one. Um, we made a, a simple, uh, simple function to just be able to com convert from from uh, Solana accounts to our own account schema and then just convert it back whenever we want. So the functions are, are what's written are made it really convenient to, 
to write the structure of the whole thing. If you really want to get deeper into the stuff, you can check on this uh, Create Genesis Config Read Leader X. Uh, like I said, it, you can find it in the test validator code. That's I. My feeling says that it that is something that's only used for the test validator, but I might be wrong. So correct me if I'm wrong. But it's really uh, it offers you to just add in all the stuff that you that you need to to get to minimal uh, custom uh, ledger that can be picked up for the uh, from the test validator that's that's basically all the things that you need what you see here and the end is just yeah that's a function cr to create a ledger it gives back the last hash because of course it's test ledger so it's gonna um it's gonna uh, run some slots and it's gonna fill in some blocks with some random data and it's going to return the last hash uh, which you could or you could use or or not I and mean, i don't know what kind of use you could do with or what can what can you use it for but it's there it's give it it gives it back so <laughs> if you want to use it you can on the end is just writing the key pairs so yeah that's basically it Really nice. Anybody has any any questions or any functions you want to see or anything? Yeah, John had a question, but I think that uh, Dean hit it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just repeat it for the you know for everyone else's benefit. So John asked, "What happens if an account you're trying to clone doesn't have an on-chain IDL to pull?" Um, so yeah, you can still modify the uh, the bytes in that account manually. It's just we don't have a way of knowing, like, um, strictly what those bytes are turning into if we were to unpack them. So we're not able to sort of be like, this is a U64, this is a pub key, whatever. Um, but you could still actually manually create an override in your uh, Validate JSON if that was a requirement. Um, but yeah, th th that's the main thing with the IDL that we just need it to um, know how to deserialize it into a struct that we can modify with you know known fields. Yeah, so that's where that's where the the Porsche specification comes in. So if you got if you got a a bunch of bytes, you have no way of deserializing it if you don't know what it should be. So you just see a bunch of bytes, but you know nothing else about it. It might be a field, or it might be an integer, or it might be something else. But if you have a JSON with an IDL, you can have a good guess, and then you can iterate through the through the the bytes, and then yeah, pick up the stuff and deserialize it, and hope that it's good. <laughs> I, I mean, until now, it uh, it works fine. So. Yeah, yeah. So great session, Berg. You killed it. Not surprised. Um, really Thanks. nice, clean, beautiful tool, beautiful explanation, really well presented. Love the Rust code, of course.